Okay, chapter six, Beast from Air. Um, Ralph is going to get the sign he asked for, but it is not going in, to be in the way you, he might have thought. Okay. Hello. Work with me. There we go. There was no light, save for that of the stars. When they had understood what made this ghostly noise and Percival was quiet again, Ralph and Simon picked him up unhandily and carried him to the shelter. Piggy hung about near for all his brave words and the three bigger boys went together to the next shelter. They lay restlessly and noisily among the dry leaves, watching up the patch of stars that was the opening toward the lagoon. Sometimes a little one cried out from under the shelters and once a big one spoke in the dark. Then they too fell asleep. A sliver of moon rose over the horizon, hardly, a, hardly large enough to make a path of light even when it sat right down on the water. But there were other lights in the sky that moved fast, winked, or went out, though not even a faint popping came down from the battle fought at ten miles height. But a sign came down from the world of grown-ups, though at the time there was no child awake to read it. There was a sudden bright explosion and a corkscrewed tail across the sky, then darkness again and stars. There was a speck above the island, a figure dropping swiftly beneath a parachute, a figure that hung with dangling limbs. The changing winds of various altitudes took the figure where they would. Then, three miles up, the wind steadied and bore it in a descending curve around the sky and swept it in a great slant across the reef and the lagoon toward the mountain. The figure fell and crumpled among the blue flowers of the mountainside. But now there was a gentle breeze at this height too, and the parachute flopped and banged and pulled. So the figure, with the feet that dangled behind it, slid up the mountain. Yard by yard, puff by puff, the breeze hauled the figure through the blue flowers, over the boulders and red stones, till it lay huddled among the shattered rocks of the mountain top. Here the breeze was fitful and allowed the strings of the parachute to tangle and festoon. And the figure sat, its helmeted head between its knees, held by a complication of lines. When the breeze blew, the lines would strain taut, and some and some accident of this pool lifted the head and chest upright so that the figure seemed to peer across the brow of the mountain. Then, each time the wind dropped, the lines would slacken and the figure would bow forward again, sinking its head between its knees. So as the stars moved across the sky, a figure sat on the mountaintop and bowed and sank and bowed again. Right, I'm going to stop right there because we need to talk about that. There is a figure a sign from the adult world, and it is um, a man in a parachute. Now, during this time, there is still a war going on in the world, and 10 miles up in the air, a pilot had to evacuate his plane, and he's coming down in that parachute. Unfortunately, the man did not make it, and so it's just his body body that is in this parachute. His body floats down and he, now it's resting on this mountain. Now it's not completely at rest. The parachute is still attached to this man. So he's in a sitting position. And as the wind's blowing, his head is kind of falling forward. And then it's coming back up as the wind's blowing. So kind of he's just kind of sitting up and then bowing down over and over and over again along with the wind, which would be really, really creepy to come across that. Okay, that's the sun. Oh, not that one. There we go. In the darkness of the early morning, there were noises by a rock a little way down the side of the mountain. Two boys rolled out a pile of brushwood and dead leaves, two dim shadows talking deeply to each other. They were the twins, on duty at the fire. In theory, one should have been asleep and one on watch, but they could never manage to do things sensibly if that meant acting independently. And since staying awake all night was impossible, they had both gone to sleep. Now they approached the darker smudge that had been the signal fire, yawning, rubbing their eyes, treading with practiced feet. When they reached it, they stopped yawning, and one ran quickly back for brushwood and leaves. The other knelt down. I believe it's out. He fiddled with the sticks that were pushed into his hands. No, 
He lay down and put his lips close to the smudge and blew softly. Softly, his face appeared, lit redly. And he stopped blowing for a moment. Sam, give us tinder wood. Eric bent down and blew softly again until the patch was bright. Sam poked at the piece of tinder wood into the hot spot within a branch. The glow increased and the branch took fire. Sam piled on more branches. Don't burn the lot, said Eric. You're putting on too much. Let's warm up. We only have to fetch more wood. I'm cold. So am I. Besides, it's... It's dark. All right, then. Eric squatted back and watched Sam make up the fire. He built a little tent of dead wood and the fire was safe, safely alight. Well, that was near. We'd have been. Waxy. Huh? For a moment, for a few moments, the twins watched the fire in silence. Then Eric sniggered. Wasn't he waxy? About the, the fire and the pig. Lucky he went for Jack instead of us. Huh. Remember old Waxy at school? Boy, you are driving me slowly insane. They're making fun of their old teacher because he was uh, grouchy. The twins shared their identical laughter, then remembered the darkness and the other things that glanced and glanced around uneasily. The flames, busy about the tent, drew their eyes back again. Eric watched the scurrying wood lice that were so frantically unable to avoid the flames and thought of the and thought of the fire, the first fire, just down there on the steeper side of the mountain, where now was complete darkness. He did not like to remember it, and he looked away at the mountaintop. Warmth radiated now and beat pleasantly on them. Sam amused himself by fitting branches into the fire as closely as possible. Eric spread out his hands, searching for the distance at which the heat was just bearable. Idly looking beyond the fire, he resettled the scattered rocks from their flat shadows into daylight contours. Just there was the big rock, and then three stones there, that split rock, and there beyond was a gap. Just there. His Sam. Huh? N nothing. The flames were mastering the branches. The bark was curling and falling away. The wood exploding. The tent fell inwards and flung a wide circle of light over the mountaintop. Sam? Huh? Sam? Sam? Sam looked at Eric ir irritably. The intensity of Eric's gaze made the direction in which he looked terrible, for Sam had his back to it. He scrambled around the fire, squatted by Eric, and looked to see. They became motionless, gripped in each other's arms, four unwinking eyes aimed at two mouths open, and two mouths open. Far beneath them, the trees of the forest sighed, then roared. The hair on the foreheads fluttered and flames blew out sideways from the fire. This quote is in your, in your worksheet for today, so there it is. The hair on his, their foreheads fluttered and flames blew out sideways from the fire. Fifteen yards away from them came the plopping noise of fabric blown open. Neither of the boy, boys screamed, but the grip of their arms tightened and their mouths grew peaked. For perhaps ten seconds they crouched like that while they were flailing fire, sent smoke and sparks and waves of inconstant light over the top of the mountain. Then, as though they had but one terrified mind between them, they scrambled away over the rocks and fled. Ralph was dreaming. He had fallen asleep after what seemed hours of tossing and turning noisily among the dry leaves. Even the sounds of the nightmare from the other shelters no longer reached him, for he was back to where he came from, feeding the ponies the sugar over the garden wall. And then someone was shaking his arm, telling him that it was time for tea. Ralph, wake up! The leaves were roaring like the sea. Ralph, wake up! What's the matter? We saw the beast plain. Who are you? The twins. We saw the beast. Quiet, Piggy. The leaves were roaring still. Piggy bumped into him and a twin grabbed him and he made for the oblong of paling stars. Falling stars. Yeah, paling stars. You can't go out. It's horrible. Piggy, where are the spears? I can hear the... Quiet then, lie still. They lay there listening, at first with doubt, but then the terror to which the description of the twins breathed at them between bouts of extreme silence. Soon the darkness was full of claws, full of the awful unknown and menace. An intermin interminable dawn faded the stars out, and at last 
At last light, sad and gray, filtered into the shelter. They began to stir, though still the word world outside the shelter was impossibly dangerous. The maze of darkness soared into near and far. And at, high, at the high point of the sky, the cloudlets were warmed with color. A single seabird flapped upwards with a hoarse cry that was echoed presently, and something squawked in the forest. Now streaks of cloud near the horizon began to glow rosily, and the feathery tops of the palms were green. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Some guys earlier just decided that they wanted to cut down a tree during the middle of my recording. So it's several hours later. Uh, I'm going to pick up right where I left off. I think it was right here. <clears throat> Ralph knelt in the entrance to the shelter and peered cautiously around him. Sam and Eric called him to an assembly. Quiet, quietly, go on. The twins, holding trem tremulously to each other, dared the few yards to the next shelter and spread the de dreadful news. Ralph stood up and walked for the sake of dignity through, though his back was his back pricking to the platform. Piggy and Simon followed him, and the other boys came sneaking after. Ralph drew the conch from where it lay on the polished seat and held it to his lips. But then he hesitated and did not blow. He held the shell up instead, of, instead and showed it to them, and they understood. The rays of the sun that were fanning upwards from below the horizon swung downwards to eye level. Ralph looked for a moment at the growing growing slice of gold that lit them from the right hand and seemed to make speech possible. The circle of boys before him bristled with hunting spears. He landed the con he handed the conch to Eric, the nearest of the twins. <clears throat> we seen the beast with our own eyes. No, we weren't asleep. Sam took up the story. By custom now, the conch did for both twins, for their substantial unity was recognized. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and talk about this line. Before we... Uh, before we had to do e-learning at school, I told you how Sam and Eric are two different people, but that they're going to start being referred to as one unit. We're seeing that now. It's not Sam and Eric anymore. It's Sam and Eric. And um, the conch, they don't have to pass it back and forth between them. If one of them has the conch, both of them are allowed to speak because the boys don't see them as individuals. They see them as both one unit they go together and <clears throat> it's interesting that they don't give them their own identities and i would think that they would want the opposite for themselves but that doesn't seem to be the case because beforehand earlier on in this chapter it says that they they never act independently of each other they're always doing the same things so it's 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 no wonder that the boys are calling them uh, one unit instead of two different individuals. So we have sort of a loss of identity here. And it's not just going to happen with Sam and Eric. The boys are going to lose their, their identities as well. Um, they're not going to be the same boys that they were whenever they landed on the island. And I think that's becoming very apparent as we continue to read. Okay, sorry. Just had to say that. So by custom now, one conch did for both twins, for their substantial unity was recognized. It was furry. There was something moving behind its head. Wings. The beast moved too. That was awful. It kind of sat up. The fire was bright. We, we had just made it up. More sticks on. There were eyes. Teeth. Claws. We ran as fast as we could bashed into things. The beast followed us. I saw it sneaking behind the trees. He nearly touched me. Ralph pointed fearfully at Eric's face, which was striped with scars where the bushes had torn him. How'd you do that? Eric felt his face. I'm all rough. Am I bleeding? The circle of the boys shrank away in horror. Johnny yawning still burst into noisy tears and was slapped by Bill until he choked on them. The bright morning was full of threats and the circle began to change. It faced out rather than in, and the spears of sharpened wood were like a fence. Jack called them back to the center. I'm going to stop again. I know I just stopped, but this is also an important quote, also in your homework. Um, <clears throat> so the bright morning was full of threats, and the circle began to change. <coughs> Apologies. I choked on my water earlier. Now I can't stop coughing. 
Okay. Basically, when they hunt, <clears throat> they, they form this circle. And they try to trap the pig inside the circle. And then they keep closing in on it, closing in on it, until they're close enough where they can make the kill, right? So that's that's their hunting strategy. This time, though, the boys have formed a circle. But instead of facing inwards like they're hunting a pig, they're facing outward. So the, the, they're pointing outwards at their spears. And it's interesting because this symbolizes the fact that the hunters are becoming the hunted. The whole reason that they're there right now and that Sam and Eric are freaking out is because they believe they saw the beast and they believe the beast has been chasing them through the forest. Of course they're lying. <coughs> we know that this didn't actually happen and what they saw was the man in the parachute who had landed right there next to him. But it was dark and they couldn't see him. And so uh, when they saw the parachute and the guy's head moving up and down, they misinterpreted it as the beast. And as they're running through the forest, they might have felt as if something was chasing them, but it wasn't. So now they've come to this group and all the boys are super afraid because now they have a sighting, an actual eyewitness of the beast, or so they think. And so this only increases their fear of this thing that does not exist. But what I was bringing up with that was that the hunters are now the hunted, that their circle has changed. This is Jack. This will be a real hunt. Who will come? Ralph moved impatiently. These spears are made of wood. Don't be silly. Jack sneered at him. Frightened? Of course I'm frightened. Who wouldn't be? He turned to the twins, yearning but hopeless. I suppose you aren't pulling our legs. Their reply was too empathetic for anyone to doubt them. Piggy took the conch. Well, couldn't we kind of uh, stay here? Maybe the beast won't come near us. For the, for the sense of something watching them, Ralph would have shouted at him. Stay here and be cramped in this bit of island, always on the lookout. How should we get our food? And what about the fire? Let's be moving, said Jack relentlessly. We're wasting time. No, we're not. What about the little ones? Oh, wait, this is Piggy. No, we're not. What about the little ones? Sucks to the little ones. Well, someone's got to look after them. Nobody, nobody has so far. Well, there was no need. Now there is. Wait, no, this is Ralph. There was no need. Now there is. Piggy will look after them. Oh, that's right. Keep Piggy out of danger. Have some sense, will you? We can, we, uh, we can, nope, have some sense. What can Piggy do with only one eye? The rest of the boys were looking from Ra Jack to Ralph curiously. And another thing, you can't have an ordinary hunt because the beast doesn't leave tracks. If it did, you'd have, you'd have seen them. For all we know, the beast may swing through the trees like what's its name? They nodded. So we've got to think. Piggy took off his damaged glasses and cleaned the remaining lens. Well, how about us, Ralph? You haven't got the conch here. I mean, how about us? Well, suppose the beast comes when you're all, all away. I can't see proper. And if I get scared, Jack broke in contemptuously. You're always scared. I got the conch. Conch, conch, shouted Jack. We don't need the conch anymore. We know who we ought to, we know who ought to say things. What good did Simon do speaking or, or Bill or Walter? It's time someone, some people knew that they've got to keep quiet and leave the deciding things to the rest of us. Ralph could no longer ignore his speech. The blood was hot in his cheeks. You haven't got the conch, he said. Sit down. Jack's face went so white that the freckles showed as clear brown flecks. He licked his lips and remained standing. This is a hunter's, oh wait, hold on, this is Jack. This is a hunter's job. The rest of the boys watched intently. Piggy, finding himself uncomfortably embroiled, slid the conch to Ralph's knees and sat down. The silence grew oppressive and Piggy held his breath. This is more than a hunter's job, said Ralph at last. Because you can't track the beast. And don't you want to be rescued? <coughs> he turned to the assembly. Don't you all want to be rescued? He looked back at Jack. I said before, the fire is the main thing. Now that the fire must be out, the old ex exasperation saved him and gave him the energy to attack. 
Well, hasn't anyone got any sense? We've got to relight the fire. You never thought about that, Jack, did you? Only, or, or don't any of you want to be rescued? Yes, they wanted to be rescued. There was no doubt about that. And with a violent swing to Ralph's side, the crisis passed. Piggy let out a breath with a gasp, reached for it again and failed. He lay against a log, his mouth gaping, blue shadows creeping round his lips. But nobody minded him. <sighs> now think, Jack. Is there anywhere on the island you haven't been? Unwillingly, Jack answered. <coughs> well, there's only... Oh, but of course, you remember, the tail end part, where the rocks are all piled up. I've been near there. The rocks, the rock makes sort of a, a bridge. And there's only one way up. And the thing might live there. All the assembly talked at once. Quiet, all right. That's where we'll look. If the beast isn't there, we'll go up the mountain and look and light the fire. Let's go. No, we'll eat first, then go, Ralph paused. We better take spears. After they had eaten, Ralph and the biggins set out along the beach. They left Piggy propped up on the platform. This day promised, like the others, to be a sun bath under a blue dome. The beach stretched away before them in a gentle curve until perspective drew it into one with the forest. For the day was not advanced enough to be obscured by the shifting veils of mirage. <coughs> Under Ralph's direction, they picked up a careful way. They picked up a careful way along the palm terrace, rather than dare the hot sand down by the water. He let Jack lead the way, and Jack trod with theatrical caution, though they could have seen an, an enemy twenty yards away. Ralph walked in the rear, thankful to have escaped responsibility for a time. I'm gonna st stop there because I missed something before and I just not thought of it. He's thankful to have escaped responsibility for a time because being chief is taking its toll on Ralph. He's having a really hard time with this new position because the boys are not listening to him. And so any reprieve from that, any relief he can get from that, he's super thankful for. And this trip is giving that for him, even though they're supposedly on their way to track down the beast. <clears throat> which should be frightening, but right now all he's feeling is relief. Now Jack said that the conch doesn't matter anymore. The conch doesn't matter anymore. We all know who ought to speak and who ought not to speak, which is interesting because they had decided that they were gonna vote on everything and that would be like a democratic society where everybody has a say. But he, by saying that, doesn't want everybody to have a say. It's like, look what Simon, when Simon tried to speak, he couldn't get anything out. And then when Bill or, and Walter tried to speak, nobody liked what they had to say. So we know who should speak and who shouldn't. Those other voices, no, they don't matter. So he doesn't want to give everybody a voice. And Ralph is still maintaining that, no, we have to have the conch. Everybody has the right to speak. And so he keeps that he keeps that, uh, not the facade, he keeps that way of thinking in with the boys just for a little bit longer. All right. <clears throat> oh, no, what did I do? Let me figure out where I just left off. Oh, man. I apologize. Okay. Simon. Simon walking in the front of Ralph felt a flicker of incredulity. A beast with claws that scratched, that sat up on a mountaintop, that left no tracks, and yet was not fast enough to catch Sam and Eric. However, Simon thought of the beast. There rose before an inward sight of the picture of a human, at once heroic and sick. He sighed. Other people could stand up and speak to an assembly, apparently, without that dreadful feeling of pressure, of personality, that could say what they would, as though they were speaking to only one person. He stepped aside and looked back. Ralph was coming along, holding his spear over his shoulder. Diff diffident diffidently, Simon 
Yeah. Simon allowed his pace to slacken until he was walking side by side with Ralph and looking up at him through the coarse black hair that now fell, fell into his eyes. Ralph glanced sideways, smiled constrainedly as though he had forgotten that Simon had made a fool of himself, then looked away again at nothing. For a moment or two, Simon was happy to be accepted, and then he ceased to think about himself. When he bashed into the tree, Ralph looked sideways impatiently, and Robert sniggered. Simon reeled, and the white spot on his forehead turned red and trickled. Ralph dismissed Simon and returned to his personal hell. They would reach the castle sometime, and the chief would have to go forward. Jack, Jack came trotting back. We're in sight now. All right. We'll get as close as we can. He followed Jack toward the castle where the ground rose slightly. On their left was an impenetrable tangle of creepers and trees. Why couldn't there have been something in that? Because you can see me. Nothing goes in or out. What about the castle then? Look. Ralph parted the screen of grass and looked out. There were only a few more yards of stony ground, and then the two sides of the island came almost together so that one expected a peak of a uh, headland. But instead of this, a narrow ledge of rock a few yards wide and perhaps 15 feet 15 long continued <clears throat> the island out into the sea. There lay another of those pieces of pink squareness that underlay the structure of the island. This side of the castle, perhaps 100 feet high, was the pink bastion they had seen from the mountaintop. The rock on the, of the cliff was split, and the top littered with great lumps that seemed to totter. Behind Ralph, the tall grass had filled with silent hunters. Ralph looked at Jack. But you're a hunter. Jack went red. I know. All right. Something deep in Ralph spoke for him. I'm chief. I'll go. Don't argue. He turned to the others. You. Hide here. Wait for me. He found his voice tended either to disappear or to come out too loud. He looked at Jack. Do you think? Jack muttered. I've been all over. It must be here. I see. Simon mumbled confusedly. I don't believe in the beast. Ralph answered him politely, as if agreeing about the weather. No, I suppose not. His mouth was tight and pale. He put back his hair very slowly. Well, so long. He forced his feet to move until they had carried him out of it on, on the neck of the land. He was surrounded on all sides by chasms, chasms of empty air. There was nowhere to hide, even if one did not, not have to go on. He paused on the narrow neck and looked down. Soon, in a matter of centuries, the sea would make an island of the castle. On the right hand was the lagoon troubled by the open sea, and on the left, Ralph shuddered. The lagoon had protected them from the Pacific, and for some reason only Jack had gone right down to the water on, on the other side. Now he saw the, the landman's view of the swell, and it seemed like breathing of some stupendous creature. Slowly, the water sank among the rocks, revealing pink tables of granite, strange growths of coral, polyp, and weed. Down, down the waters went, whispering like the wind among the heads of the forest. There was one flat rock there, spread like a table, and the water sucking down on the four weedy sides made them seem like cliffs. Then the sleeping leviathans breathed out. The waters rose, the weed streamed, and the water boiled over the table rock like with a roar. There was no sense of passage of waves, only this minute-long fall and rise and fall. Ralph turned away to the red cliff. They were waiting behind him in the long grass, waiting to see what he would do. He noticed that the sweat in his palm was cool now. He realized surprise, with surprise that he did not really expect to meet any beast and didn't know what he would do about it if he did. He saw that he could climb the cliff, but this was not necessary. The squareness of the rock allowed a sort of plinth around it so that the right, so that right to the right over the lagoon, one could inch along a ledge and turn the corner out of sight. It was easy going, and soon he was peering around the rock. Nothing but what you might expect. Pink, tumbled boulders with guano layered on them like icing, and steep slope up to the shattered rocks that crowned the bastion. A sound behind him made him turn. Jack was edging along the ledge. 
Couldn't let you do it on your own. Ralph said nothing. He led the way over the rocks, inspected a sort of half cave that held nothing more terrible than a clutch of rotten eggs. And the last sat down. At last they sat down, looking around him, tapping the rock with the butt of a spear. Jack was excited. What a place for a fort! The column of spray wetted them. There's no fresh water. Well, what's that then? There was indeed a long green smudge halfway up the rock. They climbed up and tasted the trickle of water. You could keep a coconut shell there, filling it all the time. Not me. This is a rotten place. Side by side, they scaled the last height to where the diminishing pile was crowned by the last broken rock. Jack struck the near one with his fist and, grated, and it grated slightly. Do you remember? Consciousness of the bad times in between, in between came to them both. Jack talked quickly. Shove a palm trunk under that, and if an enemy came, look. A hundred feet below them was a narrow causeway, then a stony ground and the grass dotted with heads, and behind that, the forest. One heave, Jack cried Jack, exulting, and whee! He made a sweeping movement with his hand, and Ralph looked toward the mountain. What's the matter? Ralph turned. Why? You were looking... Well, I don't know why. There's no signal now. Nothing to show. You're nuts on, on the signal. The top blue horizon encircled them, broken only by the mountain top. But that's all we've got. He leaned his spear against the rocking stone and pushed back two handfuls of hair. We'll have to go back and climb the mountain. That's where they saw the beast. The beast won't be there. But what else can we do? I'm going to stop here because I don't want to forget to mention this. But up here... Oh, Up here, um, gosh, he was pushing a rock off a cliff. He said you could push a rock off a cliff. Yeah, shove a palm trunk under that, and if an enemy came, look. So, <clears throat> basically, they're on top of Castle Rock now, and they're trying to see, first off, if there's a beast there. Of course there isn't a beast there, Jack. All right, Ralph was like, I knew I wouldn't find a beast here, so why was I so scared? Um, Jack actually really likes Castle Rock. He's like, this is a great place for a fort. We could put a fort here. And Ralph's like, there's no fresh water. And they actually did find some that was trickling down the rock. You could just put a coconut there and have fresh water whenever you needed it. Um, so they have very different opinions on this place. And that's a little bit of foreshadowing there, so keep that in mind. But... Since this is a very high kind of plateau on the mountain, there's a ledge there. And on the ledge, there's these nice sized boulder rocks that if you, you just need a little lever on them and it would fall off the cliff. And we saw earlier in the story that they were doing the same thing on the other side of the island. These boys have this weird fascination with pushing rocks off a cliff, but it is going to be significant later. So just know that they do that. Let me find out where I was. Okay. We'll have to go back and climb the mountain. That's where they saw the beast. So the beast won't be there. What else can we do? The others waiting in the grass saw Jack and Ralph un unharmed and broke cover into the sunlight. Sorry. Broke cover into the sunlight. They forgot the beast in the excitement of the exploration. They swarmed across the beach, the bridge, and soon were climbing and shouting. Ralph stood now, one hand against the enormous red b block, a block l large as a mill weed that had been split off and hung tottering. Somberly, he watched the mountain. He clenched his fists and beat hammer-wise on the red wall at his right. His lips were tightly compressed and the eyes yearned beneath the fringe of hair. Smoke. He sucked his bruised fist. Jack, come on. But Jack was not there. A knot of boys making a great noise that he had not noticed were heaving and pushing at the rock. As he turned, the base cracked and the whole mass toppled to the sea. 
and the thunderous plume of spray leapt halfway up the cliff. Stop it! Stop it! His voice struck a silence among them. Smoke! The strange thing happened in his head. Something flittered there in front of his mind like a bat's wing, obscuring his idea. Smoke! At once the ideas were back, and the anger. We want smoke, and you, you go wasting your time. You roll rocks, Roger shouted. We've got plenty of time, Ralph shook his head. We'll go to the mountain. The clamor broke out. Some of the boys wanted to go back to the beach. Some wanted to roll more rocks. The sun was bright and danger had faded with the darkness. Jack, the beast might be on the other side. You can lead again. You you have been. But we, we could go by the shore. There's fruit. Bill came up to Ralph. Why can't we stay here for a bit? That's right. Let's have a fort. There's no food here, said Ralph, and no shelter, not much fresh water. This would make a wizard fort. We can roll rocks right into, onto the bridge. I say we'll go on, shouted Ralph furiously. We've got to make certain. We'll go now. Let's stay here, back to the shelter. I'm tired. No, Ralph struck the skin off of his knuckles. They did not seem to hurt. I'm chief. We've got to make certain. Can't you see the mountain? There's no signal showing. There may be a ship out there, and you're all off for your rockers. Mutinously, the boys fell silent or muttering. Jack led the way down the rock and across the bridge. Right there, that was chapter six. And I have some, I wrote these down before. I wanted to make sure I hit all of them so that you guys can do the best on that worksheet I've assigned. Okay, so the beginning of the story, the parachute, that was the sign from the adult world that Ralph had asked for in chapter five. The pilot was part of the war. He had been shot down and killed, and now he's just kind of chilling there on the rock. And his uh, position is a little frightening because he's sitting up and the parachute is actually catching the wind, and it's causing this guy to kind of bow and sit up and bow and sit up and just constantly do that. As long as the wind's blowing, he's just le levering back and forth. And that's what Sam and Eric saw whenever they saw the beast. And that's what started all this nonsense. <clears throat> um, the sign, it should have, if they would have taken their time and actually seen it for what it what really is and not what they thought it was, it should have been a reminder to them what can happen when um, people let their uh, differing thoughts and views get the better of them. Things like war can happen. And that's why this man here that was fighting in the war, that's why he died. That should have been what it showed them. But again, they didn't get to see it for what it really was. The adult world is guilty of several crimes. But these boys are not. These boys are very young. They still have their innocence. And that is one of the major themes of the story. The loss of innocence. Not just innocence itself. But when do the boys lose their innocence? Like, what, what defining moment says, oh, no, these boys are totally guilty. This is awful. Uh, and it's a crime to humanity. That's a theme we're going to be looking into. Okay, we talked about the inward and the outward circle and what it means when the hunters become the hunted. The language in this scene, this is part of your worksheet. It asks about the language. It's in the imagery, the adjectives used there. They're becoming more and more ominous, threatening, foreboding as those boys continue to change and their fears continue to grow. So keep that in mind when you're doing your assignment. The conch. We talked about the conch and how Jack is saying we don't need any more because we know who, who needs to speak. It still symbolizes power, but mostly it symbolizes this civilized communication between the boys because it is what brings them together to have these meetings and to communicate with each other and what's going to be done. And that it still exists, so we still see that they do have at least some civilized communication between them on the island that may change 
Ralph has different motives than Jack does when they're hunting the beast. Ralph knows that there is no beast, yet he's still scared of it. Jack, it seems like he's trying to prove himself to the boys, whereas Ralph's just like, let's get an in, let's put an end to this right now. Where Jack has this need to to prove himself worthy to the boys. Like, I'm gonna hunt it and I'm gonna kill it. And yeah. And then there's Simon. Simon doubts the existence of the beast completely. There's a phrase, and I don't know if I can find it. <sighs> he was thinking about the beast and he didn't believe it was real. However, if there was going to be a beast, it took the shape of a human in his mind. And I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Yeah, I don't believe there is a beast. It's got to be somewhere around that. But anyway, <clears throat> I don't believe there is a beast. He thinks that whatever this beast is, it's not, it's not physical and in the outside world. It is within them. It is something that is changing them. And we will get to learn more about what Simon thinks of this beast, uh, I think, in the next chapter. But that's the gist of it so far. Okay, again, you have questions that you need to answer today. Go ahead and get those done, turn them in, and that's it.